Hello, everybody. Hello, and welcome back to the Bob Project. You have landed on NBA Monday, on the Career Protocol YouTube channel, and on a Bob Project video. What is the Bob Project, you may ask? Well, we are working with our subscribers to help them apply to business school and put their best foot forward, despite whatever weaknesses or uncertainties they may have about their profile. If you want to be featured on the Bob Project, you can apply anytime. Just scroll down to the link down below, careerprotocol.com slash Bob. And we'll be doing a handful of these throughout the year. So look forward to getting to know you and talking about you. And don't forget to subscribe before you submit that because we love our subscribers. We also have great stuff here every Monday about MBAs and careers and all of that stuff. So hope you will hang out with us on this channel and soak up all the good vibes and all the information we have to share. Without further ado, we have with us today, Bob. Say hello, Bob. Let us know a little bit about you. Well, hi, I'm Bob. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I my sort of profile, I guess, is that I was born and raised in California. I went to school in California, have my job in California. I'm currently remote, so I've been kind of moving around. Um, but I really want to go back. And so my top school is Berkeley, and I want to be in that area. Uh, it also kind of reflects just my work history. I've kind of stayed at the same place for almost six years now. I've kind of grinded from like a junior video editor, and now I manage the entire media team. Um, and I, I've really gone through it a little bit. Our company was has a really startup vibe. And through COVID, we really grew. We ballooned maybe twice our size, and we had two rifts in the last two years or two rounds of layoffs. Um, and through that and through managing a big team, I really got passionate about like there there has to be there could we could do better. And I I know I can't do better without more knowledge and with a better under without a better understanding of like how business works, how I can make sure my team is um, not only satisfied like with the job and like excited and passionate about what they're doing, but also taken care of. So that's really my big push of like going for my MBA learning to understand how I can better suit my team, my department, take care of the people that I care about, take care of the people that I spend eight hours a day with. And uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much me in a nutshell. That's Bob. Amazing. I love it. So usually uh, when I put together the information for this conversation, I'm just kind of looking at your statistics and I'm packaging them. But I was so inspired by the mission statement that you submitted in your form that I wanted to share it. I wanted to make sure that everybody could actually just read this whole thing because this is really you, what you're demonstrating here is really the kind of core values that all MBA programs are looking for. They, they want people, this is why they don't admit people out of college, right? This is why you can't go to Harvard. If you just graduated, if you're going to apply to Harvard at graduation, you're not going to start your MBA for two or three or four years because they need you to go out into the real world and discover the things that you think suck so that yeah. then you have material to build your future off of and it's not just looking at what sucks it's both right you look at what do you love what do you love to do what are you interested in what are the spaces that appeal to you and then also what do you want to fix what do you want to improve how do you want to make this world a better place and you've got just this fantastic statement of like yeah like i had to lay off people and man yeah. just didn't think that was cool. So I really want to move forward as the kind of leader who can who can handle things so that that can be minimized so that it doesn't have to happen so that more people can find and and like earn their livelihood. So this was and it was so beautifully written also. So that's why I just wanted to share it. Um, so so awesome. Awesome start there. And then here's here's here Bob's statistics. So you see Santa Cruz focusing in film and digital media. Back in 2017, strong GPA, 3.4 is like you're you're kind of on the table with that. You're not you're not above the average, but you're also not, you know, too far below the average. So you're mm. you got the table stakes GPA there. And like you said, you've been in media management. You've really worked your way up within an organization, which is which is great. It's a great foundation. And then you haven't you haven't done the test yet. So that's something we'll we'll chat about today. Um, so and our, you know, our goal is to get Bob into a top 15 program. Uh, you're aiming for at a few different schools, but it sounds like yeah. Berkeley is your number one choice because you want to get back to California. 
and Berkeley is is just an amazing school. Any, anything you want to say about why Berkeley is your number one? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, it really has to do with like, I guess my mission statement is that Berkeley is very centered around, at least their program is very centered around culture and company culture and just culture on campus. Um, I also know just having like applied for jobs and looked around in the Bay Area that there's a lot of companies that have different business models and are open to different ways of sort of like starting companies and building companies into the future. I've seen a lot of like flat uh, business models so instead of having a hierarchy, it's like everyone's on the same page, everyone receives the same pay, a lot of co-ops and stuff like that in Berkeley. So I just think it's it's sort of the hub for the things that I'm wanting to learn and explore. So it just kind of really just matches like how I'm feeling and wanting to pursue things. And that's what's really important for them. So it just kind of just kind of matches. I, I have like a list of other schools, but really it's like Berkeley or bust in a little bit of a way. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. It's funny. Berkeley is one of those schools that people, people go crazy for Berkeley, like more so than they should <laughs> given its position in the rankings and yeah. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's the only school uh, other than Stanford where I've had clients turn down Harvard Wow. To go to Berkeley. Like, I've never seen that for Wharton. I've never seen it for Booth. I've never seen it for Columbia. But P Berkeley. Berkeley is the school where people say, forget you, Harvard. I'm going to Berkeley. So, so, uh, so that's, so that's, uh, it's understandable. It's understandable that Berkeley would be your top choice. And I think you've already really moved your candidacy pretty far down the line by understanding the nuances of what makes the culture different, what makes the curriculum different. What makes the whole thing just really an ideal match for you? Because as you all know, the further down you go in the rankings, or maybe you don't know this, this is something I maybe I haven't ever said. The further you go down in the rankings, the more the fit has to be really ideal and really mutual. It's like if Berkeley looks at a super strong candidate, but that person doesn't look like they belong at Berkeley, they're not going to let you in. Um, it doesn't matter how strong you are. They need to see that that fit being mutual. And that's true across the board, but it gets more and more nuanced the the further down you go in the rankings. It's like most people are going to be able to show fit with Wharton, not true with Berkeley. There's there's um there's nuance to it. Um, so you've already done a lot of that work. So that's amazing. So let's talk about that test score. So what's happening there? Yeah. So, I mean, I have watched the other blobs and your advice to them was like, if you're not hitting that average, maybe switch from the GMAT to the GRE. Mm -hmm. um, and I did want a little bit of like a clarifying question around that. I know Berkeley's average is 727 for their GMAT score. And I know I probably will be coming in slightly below that or around that. But from your previous videos, I've heard you say like, if you're kind of in the like average student um, section then you're going to want to shoot for a higher GMAT. And so I don't know that I'm going to be able to get too much higher than yeah. the average. So Yeah, so if the thing is you're not going to win the day based on your test score. Sure. So um, having an average score is probably good enough. Mm. Unless, because because if you have your, if your score is around a 730, 720, you're right around their average. So if they admit you, it's it's a wash. It's not It's not hurting them not really helping them it's helping them a, a little because sure. it will admit people down here so it's helping them a little but it's but it's not hurting them that's the most important thing so then they can just kind of be like all right well fine that's fine let's focus on the rest of bob's candidacy and then they're going to dig into your essays and your interviews now they're going to look at all that stuff okay they're not going to throw away your application just because you have a low test score they're still going to give you a really earnest look no matter how weak your statistics are but when your statistics are like, yeah, kind of right around the average, now let's focus on the stuff that we really care about. That's kind of how that works. Sure. But where it comes back around is at the end. So let's say they've like interviewed you. The interview went well. They're like, okay, Bob's definitely a Berkeley kind of guy. Everything's looking good here. Now we got to shape the class. Now we got to make sure we're getting all the different kinds of people we need. We've got people from different industries, people from different racial backgrounds, people from different geographies, ages, et cetera, et cetera. The, the, now they're going to come back and they're going to play this like giant game of Tetris and like fit all the different people that they like into the pool and make sure that that pool is sufficiently diverse. 
And so that's where the test score comes back around mm. and they're going to look at you and they're going to say, okay, he's a guy. So already you're in the majority, not the minority there. And then are, do you have like any like ethno racial, like what's your background? Um, not enough. So I'm Iranian, but I think that on a lot of things you select the Middle Eastern becomes white. So you're white. Yeah. You're white yeah. for the, for the box you're going to check you're Caucasian yeah. or, or prefer not to say, okay, but you're not yeah. getting any points on that for diversity. You're just kind of like mainstream American guy. Yeah. Yeah. Which is by the way, the majority of MBA students. So there will be a lot of sure. people like you in the class, but the question is, then how how are you going to stack up against that pile? And so if your application just completely blows their mind, then the test score, as long as it's average, probably won't matter. You'll actually stand out against that pool anyway. And then there's just some chance, you know, let's say, you know, it's a, let me let me see if I can show you here. I'm going to show you with like, a, so these are like a firecrackers. Let's imagine that, that these boxes of firecrackers constitute the entire class, okay? And the entire applicant pool that's like you. So, like, it's like they can accept this many, the top this many white American guys. Yeah. And all the rest of these white American guys aren't going to get in. Are you going to be up here? Are you going to be down here? And the test score could play a role here. They could be right. like, mm, 740 and above. Unless really exceptional and then maybe you get... So, a little bit of that that's that's going to happen. And so that's why you need to have as good of a test score as you can have. Yeah. And then in that context, having a GRE, I don't think it will actually matter either way. The, the, the reason I harp on the GRE is because if you're going to be lower than the average, you will hurt their rankings less with a GRE Right. which makes it easier for them to say yes to you if they love your profile and just the test score is weak. Yeah. Well, so, I actually use the career protocol like GRE right. to GMAT converter mm -hmm. and their average GRE comes out to be like 680 GMAT, which I know I'll, I'm hoping, but I, I have a good feeling that I'll get above. Um, so I would be coming in above average on the GRE. So does that yeah, unfortunately, matter as much? I don't think that calculus works quite that way because- yeah. Because um, they they don't care that much about their average GRE. That's why the average okay. GRE is lower because so they don't care that much about it. So, like if if I um, yeah. So I think if you're gonna do seven thirty or higher, stick with the GMAT. Yeah. And if it sounds it sounds like you're around there, that will actually help you more than if you have a, a super high GRE. It'll help you more to have a super high GMAT than a super high GRE. Gotcha. So. Um, game theory, test test score mm -hmm. game theory. So yeah, I, and I think if you if you're able to submit a 720 or 730, I think you're going to be fine. And then I think with the rest of the application really coming together to showcase this like great social consciousness, this drive, this you know this persistence, and sort of like what what I think they're going to love about you is that you took a crap job out of college. But then, like, now you're, like, running the house. They're going to love that because it shows, like, determination, grit. You know, I don't want to glamorize grit. I have a whole, like, video that I need to do about that. I haven't done it yet. But um, it's not that grit is a value in and of itself. It's that mm -hmm. the people who are persistent, they have a reason. There's something they care about. There's something that really matters to them. And we started this conversation by showing that, and it, it was your mission statement. It's like, I just want to be a, an ethical and good leader. I just want to like grow up in a place where I can like shepherd and steward my people towards great outcomes. That's like a mission. And so like the grit doesn't matter. But when you have a mission like that, you naturally are persistent. You naturally push yourself and, and weather challenges. And you've really shown that in your career because you started in one place and you just like promotion, promotion, promotion. You just worked your way all the way up. And so that, that they're going to really love. They're also going to really love, I don't want to get too much into the company that you work for, but you yeah. work for a very Berkeley company, my friend. Like it's yeah. very much aligned with their uh, values is not the right word, but like, you know, culture. <laughs> yeah. So I think they're going to also appreciate that more than any other school will. 
Yeah. Um, and then um, what else can I say here? You know, you you transferred to UC Santa Cruz from uh, from a community college, from a junior college. So they also love they also love that because um, it's it's the California system is set up for that. I mean, you know, the whole system is set up for that. But it's always great when uh, when they see a person who's like it wasn't given to them. Maybe they didn't get into the right place the first time or maybe they just wanted to start by laying a good foundation before they traded up. Either way, it shows like a high degree of maturity and drive at a time when most of us are still picking our noses, you know, like 18 or 19 most people are still like, who am I? Where am I? What is this planet Earth that I find myself on? But you're like working your way through an associate's degree so that you can go to a great school. And and schools love that. Like anytime we've worked with people who did that, and it's quite common these days, um, they're, they're, they tend to be really successful because you've, you've already demonstrated. It's like when they're, when they're looking at your profile, they're not going to have a single concern about whether you're going to graduate, whether you're going to get value from the program, whether you're going to be a contributing member of the community. That's written already all over your academic transcript, like not even your resume per se. Yeah. That's in your transcript. It's clear that you're going to survive and you're going to do well and you're going to contribute. Um, so that's great. I think the uh, the other thing that we could do is is take a peek at your resume Let's uh so let's take a look here. So you have uh what's what everybody has when they start this journey, which is an industry resume and not an MBA resume. So no harm, no foul, but your goal in this process is to really upgrade your resume. And for you, this is gonna be especially important because I talked through all the ways in which you're showing character and drive and values. But what you're also bringing to the table that most um, MBA applicants aren't is that you've actually managed teams and people. That's actually the minority of MBA applicants have had real managerial experience. And so for you to be able to capitalize on that as the value add that it is to the class Especially you were talking about going to a school where the culture is all about org design and and like building cultures and leading teams constructively. You actually have tested that already. You've actually tried things and failed and made mistakes and learned things. So you want to be able to show that. And the resume is the place to do it. You won't be able to do it in the essays. There will be no room. Yeah. So uh, you're basically you want to cut all this, just like all this top stuff, just get rid of it. None of these, none of these pieces of software will be relevant <laughs> post MBA. Just delete them. Just cut it off. Okay. Yeah. Then we get into the work experience. So you're doing what most people do, which is you describe your job. You don't describe yourself or the mm. impact that you had. Mm. So um, it's great to see that somebody trusted you with 500k. But if I don't know whether or not you got a return for them on that 500K, then I have no idea how to evaluate this piece of information. Yeah. So you want to think about just even just dealing with this first bullet of like yearly departmental budget of 500K. What, what was the bottom line impact that you created with that money? So it looks like you were creating content. Yeah. Yeah. You were overseeing the creation of content. So to do that well in a business context, now there's obviously like, it was pretty, it was interesting. There's all of that, which sure. may be meaningful, if, especially if there were like comments about it or you think in some way that drove more sales because the videos look nicer. Um, great, that can be included. But let's think about this just really brass tacks in terms of saving money or making money. How did you do your job well or better in such a way that if someone else had done it, maybe it wouldn't have been as profitable for the company? Yeah, well, I, d I definitely think this plays into sort of my mission statement as well, where having to, we went from 26 people in the department to four. Um, mm -hmm. With me as sort of being the last employee in the department. And so we had our budget actually reduced far 
below that number. Like it wasn't a, an even ratio of people lost to money lost. Um, and we had to pick up all the work that was left behind. Wow. So really that was the job. And that was like what I was successful in is making sure that the four people left behind could really sustainably take on the work that was left behind and make sure that no one was getting burnt out mm -hmm. and that things were coming out, you know, the same quality that they had been and finding ways that we could be more efficient and more orga organized around what we were trying to do. Amazing. So um, one of the things that might actually, because there's several things in what you said. So there's like mm. employee management, well-being, like responsibility for not churning and burning your people. That's for sure probably warrants a bullet. But then there's probably also something really measurable, like one year we produced X number of videos with 26 people. The next year we produced X minus two videos right. with four people or whatever right. it is, right? So X actually showing... Well, I, I, I was going to say yeah. 200, but I I knew that was going to be way low. I knew that number was going to be way low. So so it's like you did the same, right? No loss yeah. of productivity. What is it? You know, 75% um, loss of resources, something like that. Yeah. So so that's meaningful. And so then, so so that's one of the results you produced was um, with uh, less than a quarter of the staff, you produced the same caliber and quantity or less than 20% of staff even. Um, then the question is, how did you make that happen? Did you implement new project management systems? Did you streamline the editing process? And if so, how? How did you ensure quality? So now we're getting into the nitty gritty of like how. How did yeah. you manage to get that done? And it may end up being multiple bullets because that sounds pretty complex. Yeah. And so there might have been stuff you did on the production side to like streamline and make it more of an assembly line or whatever to like streamline production. But then there was probably some stuff that you did around like eliminating unnecessary uh, you know, overwork and maybe that involved the project management system or different structure for communication. Maybe you even made some calls about prioritization. Like, okay, these videos we don't need. We're going to just cut those and it will have zero impact on the bottom line. And so we're going to focus on these. So there was a, there's a lot undoubtedly that went into that both for you as a video producer and content creator, but also as a manager of processes and teams. And you just want to get full credit for that. You want to get full credit for all those amazing things that you did. And so that's how you do it um, on the resume. And then you want to go all the way down and 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 do that. So here, built um, Asana ticketing framework used by all service departments. So why would I care about that? I guess it saved time and reduced errors. It reduced like duplicate work and like, stuff getting behind schedule, right? So see if you can even quantify, like, did that decrease time wasted on production? And yeah. by what percent? How can you how can you start to map the what of what you did to the so what, to the impact that it had? Gotcha. So like that top bullet point for that post-production manager, mm -hmm. uh, that would be a good way to explain the second bullet point. Like the impact that it increased had. Increased department deliverable output capacity by 80% without an increase in staff. So this is moving in the right direction, but it's yeah. it's vague in two ways. First of all, output capacity is theoretical. Hmm. Output is real. Gotcha. So I would take away the word capacity. Increased department deliverable output by 88% without an increase in staff. And, and it's then it's vague. Because I don't know what you're talking about. Did gotcha. you just use AI tools? I just I just saw this AI generated beer commercial that's circulating mm -hmm. in the meta in the metaverse. Yeah, deeply disturbing. Okay, but um, you know, was it that? Like, did you use AI to do it? Did you use like one of those plugins that does videos automatically for you, or what was it? Partly Asana, yeah. partly Asana, partly but it, Asana does nothing. Asana solves no problems, right? So sure. there must have been strategic thinking. There must have been planning. There must have been communication. A lot of other stuff that went into it. And you want to be able to show what you did. Because otherwise, just just imagine that someone's reading this who has no idea 
how anything gets done in your industry. And in fact, as I'm looking at this, you say increased department deliverable output. Is that emails? Like what even is a deliverable here? I I actually don't even know. But even if I did know that it was a video, you want to assume somebody knows nothing about what goes into video production. So when they read this, they have no idea. There's nothing in here to hold on to that gives me a concrete sense of what you did or that you were a great manager. Gotcha. So you need to make it super real for anyone and especially for people outside of your industry because that's who the admissions committee is. They have no idea about this. stuff. Gotcha. And so they're looking to you to show to really be able to showcase this is who I am, this is what I've done, this is the value I'm bringing to the table. This is part of why we've been doing a lot of experimentation with ChatGPT and it's like AI still can't solve the resume problem at all because there's yeah. so much information in your brain that it's like to to create a prompt that would create the right resume would take way more work than just doing the bullet right in the first place. So you have to really think through the details of your experience and then where did you add value and how? And then you got to boil that down to like two lines in the bullet point. Gotcha. And it's a, it's, a, it's a big challenge, but it's really, really worthwhile effort because you're going to need this skill in every job interview and in every job application you're ever going to go through. So that is your that is your other big step to take but if we if we zoom back out to to the bob project we're we're working on a berkeley application and i think you just got to stay the course with your test prep it sounds like the gmat's going to be fine for you and then you just got to go about uh you know having a great time with the berkeley essays and really showing the unique yeah. school fit that you do have already um so then it's just a matter of telling great stories upgrading your resume getting great it's just a matter of at that point the the mba execution process and for those of you who are uh looking for a way to understand everything in the application process and make it as simple as possible please be sure to check out mba 101 you can scroll down below careerprotocol.com slash mba 101 it's like our introduction to applying to business school and kind of all the big pieces that you need to be thinking about as you're applying to business school it it boils down the complexity of the process and and brings your attention just to the things that are the most important. So check it out if you haven't already, Bob, and all the rest of you, definitely check it out. While you're down there, hit the subscribe button. Um, and let Bob know. Let Bob know if you're rooting for him. I mean, honestly, I don't know how anyone could not be rooting for somebody that has a mission statement like this. I'm just going to put Bob's mission statement back on the screen again and at this point i think if anyone is still watching this video they're gonna have to scroll down and leave a comment because you you just can't not support this mission so uh if you're still watching scroll down and tell bob that you're rooting for him that you believe that the world would be a better place if he's able to get an mba and move along the path that he's outlined um everyone at career protocol sure does believe that and we are definitely rooting for you on this journey bob i hope you guys are too um anything you want to say before we before we shut yeah. it down bob um 100 i think the mba 101 stuff is gold i think you are a gift to the community and they're like 100 percent. i i have zoom meetings all day every day and i was nervous for this one because you're like a celebrity to me (laughs) so i think you make like amazing content it's been the most helpful out of everything i've researched and i really just like appreciate you so much oh amazing thank you so much it's always so weird for me to hear celebrity related comments but i'm very (laughs) gratified that a content maker likes our content that that means a lot i know johnny will also be thrilled to hear that so you um, you guys do an amazing job amazing Thank you so much, Bob. Um, All right, everybody, come back next week for more amazing MBA Monday content. And best of luck wherever you are on your MBA journey. We'll see you real soon.